Hello! Hello and welcome to or welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Katie. I was a transfer student at UC Berkeley, but I am now a recent graduate from Berkeley where I got my bachelor's degree in anthropology and I graduated with highest distinction, which is Berkeley's version of Latin honors. It is the equivalent of summa cum laude, meaning I graduated with a 4.0 and that's exactly what I want to talk about in today's video. We are going to talk about how I got a 4.0 at UC Berkeley with the caveat of the fact that I am a student with ADHD ADHD, otherwise known as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and then we're going to talk about whether or not getting a 4.0 at Berkeley is worth it. So first of all I need to give you guys a little bit of backstory. I need to explain where I'm coming from and the whole ADHD thing. I have tons of videos about my community college transfer process and the reasons why I went to community college. The main one being that I almost failed out of high school. I got a 2.2 GPA and didn't even bother applying to colleges straight out of high school. I'm not gonna go too into it but if you guys want to hear the entire story Either check out the video on the card or in the description below. I'll link all the videos that I have about that subject there. But that's the gist of the story. I failed out of high school and then after high school I took a gap year before going to community college. I went to community college and my first semester was horrible. I actually failed a class, got a C in another class, and was feeling a little discouraged and was like, okay, I need to get it together and figure out how to be good at college because I failed at high school and I really don't want to fail at college. Now at the time I had no idea that I had ADHD. I did did not get diagnosed with ADHD until last summer between the ages of 25 and 26. So I have gone this entire time not knowing that I had ADHD and trying to figure out why school was so hard for me when it seemed to be so easy for other people. I thought I would just read you guys what like the CDC has to say about ADHD because it talks about the way that ADHD impacts education and that's usually one of the first indicators that someone has ADHD is that they have a difficult time in school because the way school is set up in the American education system is that we have to sit in a classroom and pay attention to a teacher but ADHD usually makes us very fidgety or daydreamy and we have a hard time focusing our attention on the things that we're supposed to be focusing on. So the CDC says that people with ADHD have trouble paying attention, controlling impulsive behaviors, or be overly active. Some signs and symptoms are daydreams a lot, forgets or loses things a lot, squirms or fidgets, talks too much, makes mistakes or takes unnecessary risks, has a hard time resisting temptation, has trouble taking turns, and has difficulty getting along with others. There are three different types of ADHD. You can have the predominantly inattentive presentation, the predominantly hyperactive or impulsive presentation, or combined. So for inattentive people, it's hard to organize or finish a task, pay attention into details or follow instructions or conversations. Inattentive people are easily distracted or forget details of daily routines. For hyperactive people, they might fidget and talk a lot. It's hard to sit still for a long time. You might feel restless or have trouble with impulsivity. Someone who's impulsive may interrupt others a lot, grab things from people, or speak at inappropriate times. It's hard to wait their turn or listen to directions. And the combined presentation is the symptoms of both above that are equally present. And then I also want to point out out executive functioning skills in ADHD. So with ADHD we have something that's called executive dysfunction which means that we have a lack of functioning in the executive skills. Those are things like working memory, so holding on to information in the short term, organizing planning and time management, attention and concentration, behavior and emotion control, multitasking and problem solving, basically all of the things that you need in order to be successful in school. So <laughs> The question is, how did I go from a high school failure with undiagnosed ADHD to graduating from UC Berkeley with a 4.0? Let's get into it. <laughs> So I think the first thing that we need to start off with was the fact that I went to community college. Now the thing about going to community college is that you can take your classes at the pace that you need to take them at. So I wasn't forced along a four year track, I didn't have time expectations for when I would get through my courses, and if I failed a class I could repeat it, retake it without the exorbitant cost of going to a four year university straight from high school. I also went to community college with intentionality. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I first came to community college, but I knew that I wanted to be a better student. So I did things like researched how to be a better student and I took study skills courses and I formed study groups and I took classes with my best friends so that I had some measure of accountability and some kind of structure that would help me be successful in my classes. 
So community college was a huge, huge part of it because it helped me figure out how to be a student and how to make college work for myself and gave me the time to really develop the skills and the critical thinking and work on my writing skills and all the things that you need in order to be successful and get good grades at a four-year university. So without community college, had I gone straight to a four-year college, I probably would have totally failed, fallen flat on my face and not done well at all. So it's really thanks to the years that I spent in community college that helped me become a better student. Then when I finished community college and it was time to transfer, the thing about transferring from a California community college to the UC system is that our GPA resets. So I transferred to UC Berkeley with a community college GPA of a 3.7, but when I started at Berkeley, I had a GPA of zero. And I know that this is actually a point of contention when it comes to talking about the transfer systems across the nation. A lot of people think that this is really bad for transfer students because there is this transitionary period between going to a community college and going to a four-year university that can make people stumble a little bit and make it harder to get good grades. I understand that argument, but for me personally, starting over with a zero GPA I knew that I was going to do whatever I needed to do to get good grades at Berkeley and I was really excited that I had the potential to get a 4.0 and go from a 3.7 to a 4.0. The next thing I want to talk about is something I've already touched on and it's the fact that I began to take college seriously. Because of like my history of failure throughout high school, I didn't take high school seriously. I was just really tired of putting in so much effort and not getting the outcome that I wanted that eventually I just kind of gave up in high school. That's the truth of the matter. I stopped trying. I started skipping classes. That's one of the reasons why I ended up in summer school. And I just didn't take my education seriously. I think it's also really hard for people with ADHD to take education in high school seriously because you're required to take so many classes that have nothing to do with what you want to study. We have these requirements that are set out by the State that are not conducive to the learning style of a person with ADHD because ADHD people typically need something that is either novel or challenging to really get into it. So I'm very much a novelty kind of person. So if it's something I'm not interested in or it's not new to me, I want nothing to do with it. That's why I think community college really helps people with ADHD because you can start to niche down into the topic that you're super passionate about and let what we call hyperfixation, which is when we get super fixated on something and go all in on it really take over and for me it meant getting to take all the classes in the anthropology department that I wanted and taking the classes that sounded fun for my general education requirements rather than having to take the set classes that were listed for us as high school students. So because of this when I got to community college and I realized that I could take the classes that I wanted to take that sounded interesting and fun to me I began to take it a lot more seriously because I had a reason to care about it and once I figured out what the transfer process was I then had an end goal which was transfer to UC Berkeley and having that end goal meant that I had another reason to take things seriously. I wanted to take the classes I needed to take and get the GPA I needed to get and do the extracurriculars that I wanted on my resume in order to get into UC Berkeley. When you're in high school and you've already written off college you don't really have much of a reason to take it seriously. So I would take all the things that I just said and kind of package that underneath the umbrella of community college and the flexibility that it allows and the way that it's much more conducive to assisting people with a ADHD. Moving on from community college and transferring into Berkeley with a zero GPA, let's talk about my experience at Berkeley and how I managed to actually get good grades here in the classes that I was taking that would ultimately be on my official transcripts for Berkeley. So first of all, I think the most important thing about my actual experience at Berkeley is the department that I was in and my major. So like I said, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in anthropology, which meant that I was in the anthropology department. And I think it's just the nature of anthropologists is to have a different pedagogical style. So the way that they teach and the way that they grade is very different from other departments at Berkeley. In fact, a lot of my professors actually like reject traditional grading structures. So their grading structures, despite the fact that they still had to like provide final grades to the university was very different from what you'll find in say like electrical engineering and computer science or biology or physics or really anything outside the social sciences. <laughs> and let me kind of explain what that means. So the most important thing to me is the fact that the anthropology department was very reflexive. Professors did not give us like a multiple choice exam expecting us to have rote memorization and if we didn't get the answer right too bad. No, 
Most of our classes were based around seminar, discussion, participation, and then we had a couple of papers a semester. But the thing about those papers is that multiple of my professors, if they did not like what you wrote or they didn't think that it was up to their standards for their class, they would give it back to you and ask you to rewrite it and they would work with you until they thought that you had reached a satisfactory level of writing and argumentation to give you the grade that they want to give you, which was usually an A. And the reason that they do this is because in the theory of teaching and learning, actually getting to make mistakes, having the safety to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes, learn how to fix them and learn how to think a little bit differently in the future is actually what helps you learn when you're talking about something like the social sciences where critical thinking and argumentation are super important. So it was their philosophy that it was more important to them that we learned the course content, that we were able to think critically through it and present our own arguments. That was more important to them than memorizing a concept or memorizing a name and getting that right on a multiple choice exam. The second thing about the anthropology department is that none of my professors graded on a curve. Not a single one of them ever graded on a curve. And then the third thing that I want to say about anthropology my degree is something that I mentioned about my community college experience was that I had a hyper fixation on anthropology. My ADHD looked at anthropology and said that's the thing that I want to focus on for however long that hyper fixation lasts. Anthropology sparked that novelty and that interest in my brain that makes it really easy for my brain to focus on that topic. I didn't know it at the time, but what I was doing was capitalizing off of the fact that this was something I found really interesting. And when I find something really interesting, I have a tendency to be fairly good at it. So I took this thing that I was very interested in doing, went all in on it, and, and honestly, I think that that hyperfixation is kind of what propelled me through community college, transferring to Berkeley, and getting my bachelor's degree. Especially because in the last semester or so, I have started to feel that interest starting to wane a little bit. And I don't really know if it's like an ADHD hyperfixation wearing off or if it was just senioritis. But the last bit of the semester was really hard to get through because I felt like I was trying to drag my brain along, being like, come on, you can do it. We just gotta finish. Hyperfixation ending or just senioritis and burnout, who knows? But the point is, I really capitalized off of finding something that was interesting to my brain and just taking it and running with it. So the more of the story is study something you're passionate about basically. <laughs> the next thing that I did to get a 4.0 at Berkeley was I reached out for help when I needed it because I needed a lot of help along the way. And this is something that I'm always going to tell every single college student, every single community college st student, every single high school student, any type of student that you are. If you have resources available to you, take advantage of them. They're there for a reason and there's nothing shameful in asking for help. I personally asked for help in the form of reaching out to my graduate students student instructors or GSIs, which is Berkeley's version of a TA, we just have to be fancy about it. But I would reach out to my GSIs when I was having a hard time with the course content or when I was having a hard time with mental health and I needed accommodations. Or I remember this one time I reached out to my GSI and I explained to him what was happening. I was going through my ADHD diagnosis and I was trying to like grapple with that. And he said, okay, well, here's an alternative assignment. So why don't we do that? And I'll grade you based off of that instead. And so being able to have that flexibility, reaching out to my professors, getting extensions, or asking for assignment alternatives really helped me when I needed it. And again, there is nothing wrong for asking for that help. I always say that the worst thing that can happen when you ask somebody for something is that they say no. But if you don't ask, you'll never know whether or not you could have taken advantage of an opportunity or received help when you really needed it. So always, always, always reach out to your professors, your TAs, other students, the mental health services, or even the basic need services if you need help with rent or you don't have food and you need to go to the food pantry. Whatever it is that you need to be successful in college, go and reach out for that resource. Speaking of resources and accountability and structure, I also studied a lot with friends. I had a friend in every single class that I took at Berkeley and I did that on purpose. Having a friend in every single one of my classes meant that there was another person who is taking the same class as me, who is also learning the course content, so that meant I had a sounding board when I needed help thinking through the course content, as well as like an integrated study buddy into the class that I was taking. So definitely having friends in your classes and forming study groups is just another layer of accountability that is going to help you get through the courses when you're having a hard time. I cannot tell you how many times I've leaned on friends or I've asked them for help or they read my papers and edited them to make sure 
that they made sense. So building community, building this network and this accountability structure is going to be really, really helpful. Not to mention, I also am a huge fan of Accepted Society and Accepted Society's accountability workshops because there were countless times when my friends weren't available. So I would log on to the Accepted Society accountability workshops, which if you don't know what it is, it is a social network for academics across the globe, whether you're in community college, you're a grad student, you're a professional, or you're an independent researcher. It's a place where you can go to network with like-minded scholars and have accountability structures. So I can't tell you how helpful those accountability workshops were. I also want to say that having external structure and accountability, such as the accountability workshops with Accepted Society, or having friends in my classes that I could work with are also great techniques to use for someone with ADHD because it provides external motivation and external accountability that ADHD people really struggle with. Having internal motivation, internal task initiation, internal discipline is one of the hardest things possible. So having that outside structure that I built into my courses was one of the things that really helped with my ADHD. The second to last thing that I want to say is that there was a level of luck involved. Some of my professors were very easy graders. Some of my professors gave everyone like a 5% bump at the end end of the semester because of the pandemic. Some professors were kind enough to give me extensions. My GSI gave me an alternative assignment for my final. Like, So there's just like a little bit of luck involved, but I would also argue that it's not necessarily luck, it's communication. Yes, you can get lucky to get an easy professor as a grader, or you can get lucky that your GSI will give you an alternative assignment. But the thing is, you don't know that unless you talk to them, you communicate to them, and you let people around you know what it is that you're going to need to be successful in college. And then the last thing that I need to say about this is that I made a lot of sacrifices. I got a 4.0 at Berkeley because I didn't do a lot of other things. Yes, I have my job and I have my YouTube channel and I have a fiance, but there were a lot of other sacrifices that I made. Like I wasn't involved in a lot of clubs and I even had to turn down the offer to be the president of the anthropology club here at Berkeley because I knew I wouldn't be able to handle that as well as maintaining my grades. I also didn't go out and party a lot with friends, and I did spend a significant amount of time alone doing my readings and my homework and my assignments because those were more important to me. It meant that I passed up on the opportunity to do other things. And I'm not saying that it's impossible to get a 4.0 while also doing all these other things, but for me personally, it wasn't. So there was a lot of sacrifice involved. And on that note, it also doesn't mean that it wasn't hard. As much as I've had professors who are easy graders and that the anthropology department is very reflexive, that doesn't mean that I didn't stress and struggle and panic and cry and worry about my assignments and worry about my grades because Berkeley is an academically rigorous university. I've had to think more critically than I've ever had to before and I've been asked to write at a higher level than I've ever written before. So despite all of the things that have worked in my favor, I did also work really hard to get the GPA that I did. Now that you have my community college and my ADHD and my anthropology background information and all about how I got my 4.0, Let's talk about whether or not I think it's worth it. So, was getting a 4.0 at UC Berkeley worth it? Well, my answer to these kinds of questions is always going to be it depends. It depends on your goals, your values, the experiences that you want to have in college, how much stress you want to put yourself through, or what major you're in, whether or not getting a 4.0 is actually feasible in your major. I'm going to talk about both the no and the yes answer to this question. Let's start with no. <laughs> Was it worth it? Mm, no. It was stressful. It was stressful worrying about my grades all the time. It was stressful figuring out what I needed to do in order to get those grades. It was stressful emailing my professors to tell them I needed accommodations. It was stressful trying to write the best paper possible and do all my readings and try to be at the top of my game constantly. Especially, like I said, Berkeley is an academically rigorous institution, so if you want to get a 4.0, you have to be constantly at the best of your game or constantly outdoing yourself. So yeah, it can be really stressful to constantly be in competition with yourself like that. But one of the reasons why I wanted to get a good GPA is because I wanted to go to grad school at the end of my undergraduate degree. It is entirely possible to get into grad school without a 4.0 GPA. You really don't need such a high GPA to get into grad school. Your GPA is helpful for grad school, but it's more important what you write about in your essays and your experience, what your resume looks like. So I don't think it was necessary to get into grad school. The other thing I want to say is that I could have put in a lot less effort and still gotten good grades. I could, I could have gotten anything from like B pluses to A minuses or A's with a lot less effort. But the thing about Berkeley is that we do grade on a plus minus system. So A's and A pluses count towards a 4.0. Anything below
low and A is not a 4-0. So I could have put in less effort and still gotten good grades. I am just apparently super competitive with myself. <laughs> a B is a good grade. An A is a good grade. You don't need A pluses to be a good student. You really don't. And in addition, the grading system, the reason why the anthropology department rejects it so much is because it doesn't mean a lot. It means that you have figured out how to play into the system of a university grading scale to get the grades that you want to get. It's not necessarily a good indicator about whether or not you are learning the material. It doesn't take into account things that are going on behind the scenes like your home life. And it's really just one way of of subjectively gauging whether or not you have learned a particular material or performed in a particular way. So I want to make it very clear that your grades do not equal your self-worth because again, they are super subjective. And now that I have given my soapbox speech about grades, let's talk about why I think getting a 4.0 was worth it. So the first thing was that it's something I didn't have to worry about when I went to apply for grad school. Out of all the things I could worry about when it comes to applying to grad school and trying to get in, my GPA was not one of them. I knew I had the GPA and the courses and the experience that I needed to get in to get in somewhere. I checked it off the list of things to be worried about and didn't think about it again. The other reason why I think my 4.0 was worth it is because I did get into grad school and I got into grad school with a merit-based scholarship. Merit-based means it's based off of my GPA and how well I've done in my undergraduate career as well as how well my professors spoke about me and my letters of recommendation. So because I knew my professors and I performed well for them in their classes and I had that really strong history of good grades, grad school was like, hey, guess what? We're gonna give you a scholarship. And that's one of the only reasons why I can afford to go to grad school is because I got a 75% tuition scholarship to my program. And then the last thing, the last reason I wanna say why it was worth it is personal gratification, which I know sounds silly and probably not a good enough reason to stress out about getting a 4.0, but I chose UC Berkeley because I wanted to go to an academically rigorous institution. I wanted to be challenged. I wanted to grow and learn and become a better writer, to think more critically, to be able to learn the literature and apply it. So I think that my GPA is a reflection of how much effort I did put into learning and becoming a better student and a better scholar, academic, researcher, whatever you want to call it. So yeah, those are like the reasons why I don't think it's worth it and the reasons why I do think it's worth it. <laughs> I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. It's been interesting reflecting back on my experience and taking a look at the things that I think contributed to me getting a 4.0. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for my future New York City grad school adventures because I'm super excited to start my master's program at Parsons School of Design where I will be studying fashion from an anthropological perspective. Go ahead and subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.